everyone. Very good to see everyone. Very lively conversations. But uh, if everyone could take their seats, we will begin. Oh, wait, is that yours? Well, welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, uh, before we start our inspiration today, shall we just bow our heads in a quick prayer? Shall we pray? Father Lord, thank you for bringing all of us here today to worship you, to hear and learn from your word, and to be encouraged by our fellow brothers and sisters. We want to thank you for sending Jesus to suffer and die for us on the cross, and we pray that we will glorify you every day and in every way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let us celebrate and give thanks because we have a Lord who has set us free from sin and death. So shall we stand as we sing our first song, All Creatures of Our God and King. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him, Hallelujah! The opening sun with golden beam, the silver moon with.
The Christian life is also supposed to be one of death to self in order to live a life by faith. Paul told the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Being crucified with Christ means that our old nature has been nailed to the cross and has been replaced by a new nature which is in Christ. Shall we sing next, our next song, Near the Cross? Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all the healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross. trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds his beams around me in the cross in the cross
vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save than Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Thy presence, my light Be Thou my wisdom Be Thou my true word I ever with Thee And Thou with me, Lord Thou my great Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Be Thou my shield and my sword for the fight. Be Thou my dignity. Be King of heaven, when victory is won, may I reach heaven's joys, so bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever be God of every grace. This is not an easy life that we've been called to live, and I hope that this song will be a comfort to you as it has been for me. In illustrating the context behind this song, one of the songwriters, Kristen Getty, um, says that we are all tempted at different times to give up, give in, to let our circumstances steal our hope. This hymn is a prayer for his daily strength, for regular recalling of our hope, for faith to keep following, for rest in the truth that he knows, he sees, he counts the tears. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 to 11 states, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who, have called, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The music team and I will sing the first verse and chorus, and then we'll start the song again, and hopefully you guys can all join in. This world of sorrows Steal my only hope away For the power of your gospel 
shines within this jar of clay. In affliction, you bring wisdom that my comforts can displace. How my true and greatest treasure is in you, the God of praise. Now to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days, I sing through sorrow, sing with faith, oh praise the God of every grace. Okay, let's start from the start. Oh, let not this world of sorrows steal my only hope away. For the power of your gospel shines within this jar of clay. In affliction, you bring wisdom that my comforts can displace. How my true and greatest treasure is in you, the God of grace. Now to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days. I sing through sorrow, sing with faith, oh praise the God of every grace. Weary with the weight I carry, give me wings of faith to rise. For you know each grief that lingers through the watches of the night. Surely you have borne our sufferings at the cross, took up our pain. You lead us on to glory as we trust to God of grace. Now to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days. I sing through sorrow, sing with faith. Oh, praise the God of every grace. There's a dawning hope before us that I know is soon to break. As I wait upon your mercy, which will swallow every ache, cries of joy and songs of victory when we enter heaven's gate. All your children home together And with you the God of grace Now to the God of every grace Who counts my tears, who holds my days I sing through sorrow, sing with faith Oh, praise the God of every grace to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days. I sing through sorrow, sing with faith, praise the God of every grace. Oh, praise the God of every grace. Oh, praise the God of every grace. Please be seated. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right, great. 
Uh, thank you once again, Jamie and the music team for leading us in um, a time of singing songs of praise and worship to our God. And what a wonderful selection of songs that speaks um, this truth of the gospel. And thank you very much for all your encouraging singing. So a warm welcome to all of you uh, to Ligon Street's Christian Chapel uh, 11 a.m. service. Uh, my name is Ping Han, and I'll be leading you in the time of um, uh, in leading you in this service this morning. Um, it is also good to see so many of you again this morning, uh, after the great reminder that we had last Sunday, uh, that indeed we serve a risen Savior. So thank you very much for being uh, here and being a source of encouragement to everyone uh, in our Christian walk. So instead of me doing all the welcoming on my own, can I get your help to please stand up from where you're seated and, and help me out by saying hi to one another um, and look out especially for people that you haven't met before and give each other a warm welcome. Let's do that. All right, thank you for helping me out. Um, I might continue on by um, extending a warm welcome to those of you who are present here for the very first time. So if that's you, uh, may I invite you to stand up from where you're seated, starting from the rows on my left all the way to the right. Um, and firstly, tell us who you are and where you're from. And we would like to extend a really warm welcome to all of you uh, as a church. Um, so as you do that as well, uh, before the end of today's service, please make sure that you click the connect form on our church bulletin to fill out some of your details so that we can connect with you in the coming week. So let me begin with the row on my left-hand side. Is there anyone who is present here for the very first time? No? Okay, all right. Moving on to the rows in our middle, but I'll first... Um, like to extend a, a welcome back to um, the missionaries that we partner with, David and Kathy Walter. Uh, so they are here with us this morning. So warm welcome to both of you once again. Um, just moving on to the rows in the back. Anyone who's present here for the first time? Just raise your hand. Yes. Elizabeth from Adelaide, we would like to welcome you. Anyone else? All right, apart from Elizabeth, anyone else? Just moving on to the rows on my right-hand side. All right, okay, that's great. Great to see all of you again. Well, this morning, we will be continuing on with the sermon series uh, from the book of Colossians. And we're very grateful to have um, David Walter speaking to us a bit later in today's service on Colossians chapter 3 uh, as we look into a holy living. It's a bit more update uh, from David and Kathy uh, later in the service. But before we do that, let's go, on, go through some announcements. Um, if you have your smart devices, feel free to scan the QR code displayed on the front screen. Or if you are listening in from home, um, please do uh, scan the QR code displayed on your screen. The first thing is um, for those who are seated here, there will be church lunch later today. So um, please do join us in this um, fellowship lunch uh, at the end of today's service. All of you are welcome. And for first-time visitors, it is free of charge. Uh, we accept uh, love 
gift donation uh, for the rest. But if you're first time visit uh, visiting here uh, for the very first time, um, it is free of charge. All right. Um, the second, third, and fourth announcements are all very important dates um, that I'd like you to pay attention to, and please mark them down in your calendars. So the first one is um, with regards to the Carlton Gospel Fellowship Evangelical Night. Okay, so that's the student group that meets every Friday night in our church. They will be having an e-night or evangelism night on Saturday the 20th of April at 4 p.m. Uh, dinner will be served. It, it will be a good time uh, for um, the students or young adults to, um, to invite your friends and colleagues to hear more about uh, the Word of God being preached uh, and to hear the Gospel message being preached. So mark this date down in your calendar, Saturday the 20th of April 2024. Okay. The next two couple of announcements are um, also very important dates that I'd like you to mark down in your calendar. It is a very exciting year for our church. This is a term one school holidays year. Those uh, fam families with children, you're very familiar. It is we're in the middle of school holidays. But for the coming school holidays, so term two, term two, for the first week of Term 2 school holidays in July, from July 1st to the 5th of July, um, there will be VBS. Okay, so Vacation Bible School um, for all primary school children. Please mark these dates down in your calendar. More details will follow in the coming weeks, but uh, the team, uh, led by Alethea and the Sunday School team, will, are starting to look for volunteers to help out with those few days of VBS. So for parents, please mark these dates down in your calendar, 1st to the 5th of July. And for everyone else, including parents, um, please consider, prayerfully consider how you can uh, help out in this very important children's ministry. All right. So moving on to the final announcement. Again, very important dates. Our church will be having a church camp this year. So that's um, from the 13th of July. September to the 15th of September. So we haven't had a church camp for a long time, and it will be, for those of you who have been to Belgrave last weekend, you can, you can tell that it is, uh, the fellowship is, is, um, is warm and is loving. So it's good to extend that sort of fellowship uh, to the broader church um, through a church camp from the 13th to the 15th of, of September. Mark these dates down in your calendar, and more details uh, will follow in the coming weeks as well. And I've been told the campsite is fantastic. All right, so something to look forward to as a church uh, this year. Camp, church Camp 2024. All right, um, that's all the announcements that we have this morning. I'll let you read the rest in your own time. Uh, let's move on to the time of uh, offering. And Christian offering is indeed uh, an act of worship for all of us. And God has been tremendous in, our, in His giving to all of us in our Christian life. So why don't we give back to God a portion of what he's given to us uh, to support the local work here in this church and also to support our missionaries abroad. Uh, if you're not a Christian and you're not familiar with this, uh, please feel free to let the bags pass. Uh, thank you, Ashes. Well, I should also mention that today is um, 
uh, Wesley Chow, uh, one of the brothers who have been attending our church uh, for quite some time now. It's his um, final day with us before he moves on to Canberra um, to gain some ministerial uh, experience work uh, at Southside Church. So in the next moment, I'd like to uh, pray together as a church um, for the things of this church and to also uh, pray for our brother Wes. So Wes, if, I'd like to, if you'd like to come up here, we can pray together for you. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads and pray. Um, Dear Father in heaven, I thank you so much for um, the gospel ministry here at Ligon Street Christian Chapel, that indeed, in spite of who we are as sinners, you have chosen us and you have given us your love uh, by giving us the gift of your son, Jesus. Lord, indeed, um, our identity and our soul identity is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. And that we indeed, we are sinners who have been saved by your grace. Father Lord, we thank you so much for enriching our church too with um, so many different ministries. And we thank you for the various growth groups or Bible study groups that you have entrusted upon our care. And we pray, Lord, that these groups will continue to grow and flourish and bear fruits. Lord, we thank you especially for yesterday, for the... um, Uh, Bible Study Leaders Workshop uh, conducted by Pastor Melvin uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, yesterday morning at our church. And we thank you for the very encouraging turnout. And for the many who attended, we pray, Lord, that the lessons learned uh, will be used to better serve uh, and shepherd your people so that we may all strive uh, to live Christ-centered lives. Lord, we've also heard that um, today uh, our brother uh, in Christ, Wesley, um, will be uh, embarking on a new journey to gain more ministry experience uh, in Canberra. So, Lord, we ask that you will guide him and provide him uh, with your wisdom. Uh, bless him, Lord, with a safe journey uh, as, he's, as he makes his way up to Canberra later today. And we, as he settles down in this new church, we pray and ask, Lord, that you will provide for all his needs and that you will provide him with a new community of uh, Christians that he can continue to grow in and to serve along with. Lord, and as he serves you, help him, Lord, to always look to you, look to the cross uh, for wisdom, for strength, for comfort, and for joy. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Wes. Uh, feel free to catch up with Wes um, during church lunch later on. Um, before, before the kids um, get too excited to head to the back hall for um, uh, the Sunday school, we will just um, hold on tight a little bit. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, invite David and Kathy Walter up to the stage um, to, um, to give us a little update uh, on the work that they have been doing. So as, um, hopefully the microphone here is working. I'll just uh, check that. All right. PA team, yep. Hello. Okay. All right, yep. great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so as, Ke- as all of you would know, David and Kathy, they were part of the furniture of this church many years ago until they decided to leave and they went to um, uh, Queensland for quite nearly a decade now yep. and before they um, made the decision to move back to Victoria. And I did do a bit of research before today, oh, no. I looked up that, um, <laughs> I looked up that um, today, the weather in Queensland shows the temperature of 29. In contrast to that, the weather in Victoria today is rainy and 19 degrees. So clearly yeah. you've chosen Try well. For us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It actually feels much colder. So, okay. um, so um, yep. obviously mm-hmm. in the last year or so, there's been a lot of movements for both of you and there's been a lot of changes to your work. So over to you now, if I could hand the mic over to you, and uh, perhaps you can give us a little update on, um, on the things that you've been doing um, this time around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I work mainly with uh, students, university students, across the South Pacific region. So I actually spend a lot of time either on Zoom, uh, talking to ministry staff about what they're doing, uh, at my desk, uh, planning to go and uh, teach or train uh, students and staff, uh, on aeroplanes or on islands, 
um, doing that stuff. In some ways that hasn't changed for me very much from what I was doing in Brisbane. It's now I fly out of Melbourne Airport instead, which often means I have to fly two flights rather than one. Um, I also do some, some uh, other coaching of people in ministry. So. Um, until recently, I was working with international students in Queensland, um, and it's a great privilege to be on campus, meeting students and sharing Jesus with them. Um, but recently, we moved back to Victoria to basically to be closer to our parents as they age, and I've started a new national role with AFES, our um, national uh, student movement. Um, so my role now is to support our staff, particularly our female staff, but across the country. Um, it's, it's really a bittersweet kind of job because um, it pains me to be off campus because that's where, where the real action is, where we get to meet students and encourage them in their faith and uh, disciple and train them to reach out to their fellow students. But it's the staff um, who I think are still our greatest lever in, in achieving that end. And so my role now is to support those staff as they seek to reach out on campus amongst the students. Yeah, so it's a new role, still working it out a little bit. Yep. Oh, thanks for all that um, information and update, um, Dave and Kathy. Uh, obviously, um, I'm guessing that you, both of you are still adjusting to your new role. What do you see as the uh, potential challenges that you might uh, face for the rest of the upcoming year? Yeah, yeah. And some of the challenges is just what Cathy was talking about, that is we spend more time with staff than with students. Students are great, staff are boring, so that's kind of hard to adjust to. Um, so that's one. Uh, two is uh, travel. We both do a lot of travel, I do, uh, a lot of international and domestic travel, um, and that's just tiring. Um, three is cross-culturally. It's so easy to be misunderstood uh, across different cultures. Uh, and for me, because I work, all, all ministry is done in fellowship and in partnership. And I have very strong ideas about how I think ministries can be planted or grow or develop, but I have to work together with people who uh, live and serve locally to, to make sure we do that well. And so it takes a lot of patience uh, and a lot of wisdom, and I'm not a very patient or wise person. So, Yeah, I think the challenge for me is just as I settle into this new role and work out um, how best to serve the staff, and as I get to know them and, um, yeah, that's takes time for relationships of trust to build um, so that I can come alongside them and yeah, encourage and support them as they need. So that's, that's the challenge for me, working out how I can best serve them and be useful in the organisation, I think, yeah, in the coming year. Final question. Yep. How can we pray for both of you as a church? Uh, it'd be great to pray that we settle in well to Victoria. Um, I'm struggling with the weather. I've had the flu and hay fever and all sorts of kind of crazy things, so that'd be great for kind of... Yeah. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. It's really lovely to be here. Uh, <laughs> so I think um, for that, uh, for um, wisdom as we seek to join a local church, we've been sort of checking out churches around where we live in Ocean Grove outside Geelong, um, and it's always tricky to work out where to go to church. We worked out this morning, it's about an hour and a half commute from home, so it's a little bit hard to come to like on every week. Uh, but yeah, yeah, wisdom in doing that I think would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, just wisdom and love as we as I seek to come alongside the staff, I think, um, and gentleness, yeah, um, in that. Um, patience as I seek to work out, you know, how best to do this new role. Um, yeah, I think they're the things to pray for. But can I just also say what a delight it is to be with you again today, and we're so, so thankful for your partnership with us and support. It really does feel like being home with you all again, so <laughs> we miss you, um, and it's lovely to be here. So, yeah, praise God for faithful partners like you guys. We really are thankful. Thanks, David and Kathy. I think that feeling is mutual. So um, why don't we stand up as a church, and uh, shall we pray for uh, David and Kathy? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, and that we are so deeply encouraged uh, by the gospel works that you're doing through the lives of our brother and sister David and Kathy Walter. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege that our church family is able to share uh, in this gospel, very important gospel partnership uh, through AFES and through David and Kathy. We thank you, Lord, for the good part of the last decade that they could spend uh, up in Queensland and for the many friends that they can now call family and for the many gospel seeds that were planted. And as, as they navigate through the many changes and challenges for the upcoming year or years, 
We pray, Lord, that you will continue to watch over them and provide for their needs. Lord, we pray and ask for love and for patience, for endurance, and as they also seek to find a, a, a local church um, to attend and to serve in, we pray, Lord, that you will help them in that process, that you will guide them, and that they will be able to find a church to settle down in. Lord, we, we also know that the work uh, can often be tiring, so we pray, Lord, that um, you will give them the energy that they need in order to serve you more effectively. Uh, we ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, children. You may now head to the back hall for your Sunday school with your teachers. And as the children make their way to the back hall, um, can I uh, please invite Magdalena um, to come up to the front and uh, to read for us from the book of Colossians chapter 3. Thank you, Magdalena. Good morning, church. Today's Bible reading comes from the book of uh, Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. I will read in the name of the Lord. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of this, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as, as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its, with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Okay, you can hear me? Wonderful. Uh, it is, as Cathy said, wonderful to be with you today. It's really great uh, to be together. And in fact, to prepare for being here today, I watched the last four weeks of services on YouTube. I saw some really interesting things, actually, as I watched those services. Four weeks ago, there was Gavin preaching 
uh, wearing a blue Ralph Lauren shirt, uh, fawn colored pants, very elegant, uh, and a nice brown belt. Three weeks ago, I saw Melvin with an elegant but subtle light colored shirt complemented by taupe colored trousers. Two weeks ago, there was Gavin wearing pink, very masculine pink, Ralph Lauren shirt, fawn trousers, brown leather belt, and boots. And then last week, there was Melvin wearing a very funky blue patterned shirt with, with again, some taupe colored trousers. After watching all of those church services, my big question was, what should I wear? <laughs> See, I've been living in Queensland for nearly 10 years, and in Queensland, getting dressed up means wearing a clean T-shirt. So that I'm, I'm back in Melbourne, so what should I wear? Today, I really wanted to wear something that's just right, something that fits in with Melbourne, something that's appropriate for Ligon Street and something that really fits with Ligon Street Christian Chapel. I wasn't sure what to wear, so I chose a Samoan shirt, because if you don't like it, it means you're a racist. <laughs> in Colossians, in the book of Colossians, clothing is a metaphor for the Christian life, for Christian behaviour, for Christian character. And it's not about fitting in with others so they are pleased. It's actually about fitting in with who we are, whom God has made us to be, so that God is pleased. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul will call on us to get our identity right, to get our minds right, to get our hearts right, to get our behaviour, our words, to get our lives right. How do we do that? By knowing what God has done for us and whom God has made us in Christ. But let's just go back a couple of steps. In the book of Colossians so far, we've seen lots and lots of things over these last four weeks. In chapter 1, we saw Paul say that we have not stopped praying for you so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way. Now, what Paul prayed for the Colossians in chapter 1, he now urges the Colossians to do, to enact, in chapter 3. And Paul gave us a wonderful summary statement of the whole book back in chapter 2, verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. And Paul reminded the Colossians of what God had done for them. So he said in chapter 2, verse 13, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. If you put your trust in Jesus, you've been raised with Christ. In fact, if that's you, then Colossians chapter 3 is for you. But it's also true, if that's not you, then Colossians 3 is not really for you. If you haven't put your trust in Jesus, if you're back in the situation of not being raised with Christ, if you're still dead in sin and needing someone to raise you to life, if you haven't decided, if you believe the Bible when it says that Jesus is the glorious Lord and the sacrificial Saviour, what you actually need to do is to work out whether really it is true and turn to Jesus. Decide whether you're going to turn to Jesus or ignore Him. See, I make this distinction because Colossians 3 is not about how to be a better person. Paul is no self-help guru. No, it's about how to live the life that Christians have been given, the life that Christians have been raised to, by Jesus and with Jesus. It's, in a sense, a call to live the resurrection life. For the key to the Christian life is Easter, which is why we celebrated it last weekend. You'll see what I mean. Look with me, if you would, at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, as we see Paul talk about living a resurrection life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, starts like this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Notice that? 
He's saying, if you're a believer, if you have faith in Jesus, this is you, you've been raised with Christ. And since you've been raised with Christ, what should you do? Well, he tells us, verse 1, set your hearts on things above. Set your desires on things above, seek things above, focus your heart there. But what's above? Well, verse 1, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Christ is there. Yes, Jesus is there with God the Father. It actually sounds a lot like uh, Psalm 110 verse 1, where God says to His Messiah, His Royal Son, sit at my right hand, that's right, isn't it? Sit at my right hand. And who is God's Messiah, God's Royal Son? Jesus. So Paul says, set your heart on Jesus, the Heavenly King desire Jesus, to be with Jesus. See, Paul's not giving us the image of heaven we see in movies, you know, where there's uh, people uh, floating around, excuse me, uh, where there's clouds and wings and white robes and harps, but there's actually never Jesus. No, Paul is actually showing us Jesus talking to us about Jesus. Set your hearts on Jesus, the heavenly King. Desire Jesus. Set your affections and desires on Him. What's the primary blessing of the Christian life? What's the most important thing that faith in in Jesus gives you? Answer, Jesus. See, it's not that we climb over Jesus to get to these other great things what we get is Jesus. Focus on Him. He's at the centre of our life and of our faith. So Paul says in verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Set our minds, think about Him, have Him as the focus of our thoughts. Christ is the focus. He's there with God and our life is there too. Paul says, not on earthly things. What are the earthly things? What should we not focus on? Living under the control of false religion, hollow and deceptive philosophy, chapter 2. Living under the control of the sinful nature. Paul talks about both in Colossians 2, but we're dead to such things, they're earthly things, whereas Jesus, He's our heavenly Master. And now there are two really unusual statements that pick up these ideas in verse 3. Verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. What does it mean that our life is hidden with Christ in God? Well, there are two great truths that are not obvious right now. Number one is, it's not obvious that Jesus is the Son of God the master of the universe. Now, as we look around the world, we can't see that, it's not obvious. It's a a hidden reality. And two, it's not obvious that we are God's children who have eternal life with Him. Now, as you look around, you can't see that. It's a hidden reality, hidden with Christ, hidden in God's safekeeping. Also, verse 3, did you notice, starts for you died. You died. I can't remember dying. Anyone else remember dying? Anyone? Anyone who's alive here today? No, you can't remember. So, what is Paul talking about? I asked a a friend of mine uh, a little while ago, who just turned 30, what they did for their 30th birthday, and they told me they went skydiving. Now, personally, when I travel on a plane, I like to stay inside the plane, but they really wanted to jump out of the plane. Maybe they thought 30 was enough years on the world, I don't know. Anyway, I said to them, look, how was it? How was skydiving? And they said, get this, they said, boring. I said, you jumped out of a plane and it was boring? They said, oh yeah, absolutely. See, what they do is they they harness you to this other guy. They don't let you jump out of the plane by yourself, very smart people. They, they, They tie you together with another guy he's really experienced and so he does all the really exciting stuff and you just kind of sit there 
just kind of hanging on a rope that's connected to him. So he decides to jump out of the plane, he pulls uh, the lever, so the parachute opens, he even kind of really lands on the ground, you sort of just land on him. It was kind of boring, you don't really do anything. Brothers and sisters, our salvation was kind of boring. Jesus did it all. See, he died, he was buried, he rose again. But actually, by connection to him, by a union with Christ, by being joined with Jesus, that is true of us as well. See, we died with him as well as being raised with him. And that's what I think Paul is talking about. We died, verse 3, and we were raised, verse 1, not by ourselves. We didn't do it. We've died and been raised with Christ, through Him, because of Him, with Him. But even then, that's not the end of the story. No, no, have a look at verse 4. See, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Jesus will return and when He does, who He is will be obvious. He will appear in glory. And so, who we are will also be obvious because we'll be with Him. We are Christ's, uh, we are in Christ now and our life is hidden with Christ now, but when He returns, we will live with Him and share in His glory for all eternity. So, setting our hearts and minds on Christ now is like being trained and orientated for eternity. And so, we are people who will be with Christ forever. If we are people who have our desires and thoughts on Jesus, if our hearts and minds are set on things above, if glory is our future, how should we live? How should we live? Not live by a set of rules and laws. No, that was one of the false trials, you remember, in chapter 2. No, we should live now shaped by the reality of who we are and who we will be. And we should leave behind who we used to be and who we no longer are. So we should actually kill what should be dead in our lives. And this is what Paul goes on to talk about in verses 5 to 11. See what he says in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Remember, we were buried with Christ and raised to new life. So an old life of sin and human religion has no place in our lives anymore. They're like weeds in a beautiful garden. They don't belong. I'm a terrible gardener, but even I know this. What do you do with weeds? You kill them. You murder them. You don't let them linger. You show them no mercy. You pull them up straight away as soon as you see them. You kill them because they should be dead. You don't want them in your garden. And so you execute them. Don't try to contain or control sin. Kill it. Kill it. That's what Paul's saying. That's what we must do with sin, the earthly nature. And what sort of behaviours belong to that earthly nature that we must kill? What sorts of things are there inside? Well, verse 5 tells us. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust. Sexual immorality means having sex with someone you're not married to. So, Paul is saying that setting your mind on Jesus, saying yes to Jesus, means saying no to sex outside of marriage. Whether that means sex before marriage or sex when you're married, but actually having sex with someone else you're not married to. Don't believe the world. What God says through Paul is either get married or murder sexual immorality. They're the two options for a faithful believer. God says sex is for people who are married to each other, 
married in a biblical sense. Now, some things aren't technically sex, exactly, so they fall into the category of impurity. It might include uh, other wrong things we might do or say within the general kind of sexual area. It's stuff that needs to die too, even if it's not technically sex. If it's unhelpful, if it's impure, it should die. And so should lust. Lust is not about what we do or say. Lust is about how we think and feel. It's looking at someone you're not married to with sexual thoughts and desires, unconnected to love and commitment within marriage. It's the problem with pornography. See, pornography is designed to keep you living a life of lust. So we need to kill it. Not entertain it. Not try to reduce it. Kill it. Paul says that people who desire Jesus need to kill lust. So that's what we must do. And in this sex-obsessed culture we live in, you actually might need some help. You might need some help. It's a major challenge. So if you know you need extra help, as embarrassing as it might be, reach out to someone else and ask for help whether that's accountability or the kind of tech stuff that doesn't allow you to see pornography, whatever it is. We all need help to kill off our old self. In fact, that's why part of why church exists, isn't it? We're a kind of hit squad to seek and destroy sin together. But it's not just sex. No, verse 5 says, toward the end, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Evil desires is a broad category, uh, but there are so many ways in which we could sin, we do sin, so it's actually a really helpful category. And whatever's in that category, let's exterminate those evil desires. And then there's greed. Our world is built on greed, isn't it? I mean, advertising is all about convincing you that you need more and that life really is ultimately about having stuff, about having things, things like nice cars, big houses, huge TVs, beautiful furniture, fancy toys and money, lots and lots of money. But if you live for these things, if your greatest desire is for these things, what's that called? Idolatry. Idolatry. Living with money and possessions as God. A God in place of God. Is there idolatry in your life that you need to kill? Has greed and aspiration for great wealth taken over? Is it driving the way you live? Kill it. Put it to death. Get rid of it. See, Paul explains how terrible all these traits are and why we should kill them. For he says in verses 6 and 7, verse 6, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Paul is not saying, well, be careful, God will judge you. No, Jesus has already taken the judgment for us on the cross, for all believers. But he is saying that these things are so terrible that God will judge because of them. God will judge everyone who is not in Christ because of them. That's what the Colossians used to be like. If you're not a believer, that's... Sorry, if you are a believer, that's what you used to be like too. And if you're not a believer, this is where you stand with God's judgment coming. In fact, sin is so serious that God's judgment is coming because of it and God's judgment is so serious that Jesus is the only hope. So if you're not a believer, please, please turn to Him today. Turn to Jesus today. And if you are a believer, please see what Paul is saying. 
He's showing us how horrible sin is, how displeasing to God it is. And so he says in verse 8, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Notice the way he, that he uses the language, rid yourself, throw them away, put them in the bin, put sin in the bin. That's what he's saying. Which ones? Well, here's a nice little sample pack for you. Anger, rage, malice, slander and filthy language from your lips. Rage means doing terrible things to harm other people when you're angry. Malice means doing terrible things to harm people when you're not angry. It's actually cold-blooded planning to do harm to others. And slander. Slander. Words that tear down rather than build up. Slander, we have to be so careful about this, don't we? Because it's so easy for kind of sharing prayer points or having a deep conversation to become slander and gossip. We have to be so careful. In fact, when it becomes slander, you have to put it in the bin. And the F word, the F word, filthy. Filthy language that does no good and is just ugly. In the bin it goes. Get rid of them, Paul says. Put these sins in the bin, Paul says. In fact, Paul says, don't just leave it lying around, put sin in the bin. And there's another one. Verse 9, do not lie to each other. Lies are so great, aren't they? Lies are so useful. Lies are like the Swiss army knife of sins. See, because lies can get me out of trouble and put you in trouble. Lies can make me look better and make you look worse. But it's not who we are anymore. It's not who we are to be. Paul says, stop being who you are not and be who you are, a new self, that reflects God's character. Don't lie. It's really interesting, actually, when you think about the way the chapter is working, that all of the necessary change is driven by setting our hearts and minds on Christ. Because as people who have died and been raised with Christ, we have a new self, a new identity. We have a new process. We're being renewed to know God. We're being remade in God's image. Of course, you know, when God gave us life in creation and Genesis 1, He made us in His image, though that image was scarred when we sinned in Genesis chapter 3. Now we're being remade in His image as God gives us new life in Christ. So Paul puts all of these complex things together in verses 9 and 10 and says this in verse 9, since you've taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Do you see what he's saying? Let me put it another way. Who, when you were at high school, who had to wear a school uniform when you were at high school? Yep, yep, me too, great. Who still wears their high school uniform around the place? Anyone? Anyone? That's a great relief. I asked that question another time and I think, I better not tell you who it was, someone told me that they actually still wear it sometimes. Very strange person. (laughs) And I say very strange person because you think, school uniform, of course we don't. That's just stupid. What a stupid question. See, it was part of the old life as a school kid, but now we're living a new life as an adult. So, of course, we don't wear our school uniform when we go to work or uni or or even go to the gym. No, that's part of the old life. It would just be weird and out of place to wear the school uniform now. It's not part of who we are anymore. That's the same with the Christian life, isn't it? Including lying and all of those sins. Don't do that old behaviour. We are, without exception, as believers, people who live a new life because we are new. We've been given a new life. In fact, it's true for all believers. Paul's making that point there in verse 11. 
here, that is, with this new life being remade in the, being remade in the image of its creator, there is no Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul's saying, regardless of our birthplace, our background or our bank account, we all belong to Jesus by faith. He, he dwells in us by His Spirit, renewing us. And our lives are to be focused on Him as we live to please God. Paul is calling on us to kill, to put off, to dispense with sin. But he doesn't just give us the negative side, actually, thankfully. He also gives us the positive side. He shows us what we should do and what we should be, or metaphorically, how to dress for the raised life. See, listen to how positive this is, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Notice there where to put on our clothes, our identity, as people who are already loved and chosen, who've already been made holy by Jesus' death. It's not by doing these things that you become uh, Christian, but rather being Christian, we do these things. It's like Vegemite. You can't become an Australian by eating Vegemite, but any decent Australian, and I'm looking at you, Melvin Lowe, should eat Vegemite. You understand? Great. Good. The Vegemite police will come and get you otherwise. And look at those clothes, look at these beautiful virtues that we're supposed to live out now, we're supposed to put on now. Look at those clothes. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Compassion meaning genuinely caring for people in need. Who are those people around us who are in need inside the church and outside the church? Who are those people? And what can you do to help them? I'm I'm really dumb at these things, I'm really terrible at kind of thinking of ways of doing things. So one of my big ones is just simply I give blood. I give a blood plasma, I try to do it every two weeks. I've got a lot of blood, uh, so I just think, well, there are lots of people who need it for their cancer treatments uh, and their other other, um, treatments for their health. But you might be much more creative, much more insightful and think of good ways to do that. Or kindness, graciously thinking or doing the best for others. When we lived in Brisbane, one time uh, there was a, a lady at church, an older lady, and her husband had died. So you know what we did for her? We took her to the movies and had lunch with her. Nothing dramatic, but just a little kind thing that she really appreciated. Humility, looking out for the benefit of others before yourself. Gentleness, not using power against people, but for people. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that Jesus himself refers to himself as being gentle and humble in Matthew 11, verse 29. So to be humble and gentle is to be like Jesus. And patience, not pushing people, but waiting for people. It's very different to the impatient world that doesn't listen and deals harshly with people. In fact, all these virtues are such a contrast to the list of vices above that the world embodies. And when we look at these virtues, that's what people should see in the way that we treat them. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. That's what people should see when they look at the way that we treat other, each other the way that things work inside this church. It's such a beautiful picture of church, isn't it? A beautiful picture of church. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And there are even more features. See, look at verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
Some of us know all too well the harsh reality that people will do the wrong thing to you. They will wrong you. And other Christians will wrong you. And sometimes, terribly so. And the Christian way, the Christian mechanism for coping with that is forgiveness. As Christians, we are forgiven people, forgiven by God through Jesus. So, if there is an unresolved issue, what should we do? Forgive. We live as forgiven people and we're to forgive others. If there's an unresolved issue between you and someone else here today, today is a great place to talk to them And you can say the hard word, you did something wrong to me, and you can say the glorious word, and I forgive you. Please don't let that fester. No, forgiveness is the lifeblood of churches. The forgiveness given to us by Jesus that we are supposed to live out. We are supposed to be forgiven forgivers. Let me ask you, who's new to Melbourne or new to Australia this year? Anyone new to Melbourne, new to Australia? Yeah, a few people. Okay, okay. Have they warned you about winter yet? Have they told you? I know you're thinking, oh, it's already super, super cold. No, no, no. It's only April, okay? (laughs) Technically, winter starts in June. So, just let your mind process that for a moment. If it's already this cold today and we're not even halfway through through April, by the time it gets to June, how cold is it going to be? I know you're thinking to yourself, no, no, it's okay. I've got a jumper. I've got a jacket. Not enough. No, you'll need more. See, when the wind will come through and it'll kind of blow through your jumper and even open up your jacket. You think, I've got a scarf. Still not enough. No, you'll need more. You know what you need? An overcoat. You do. You need this coat that actually holds together the jumper, the jacket, the scarf and anything else you might be wearing. And it just kind of finishes the ensemble as well. But also, it'll just keep you warm. It'll hold it all together. That's the image that Paul uses, I think, in verse 14. Verse 14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love, the great Christian overcoat that holds it all together and makes it work. God wants us, Jesus wants us to love others and live in loving relationships. Love is the quintessential Christian virtue. Why? Well, Jesus puts it this way in John 13. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must must love one another. In fact, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I think there's actually a similar idea even in verse 15 as well. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. Here it means the relational peace that believers have, because they have peace with God, we have with one another. So that peace should drive our hearts to live at peace, that is in healthy, loving relationships with each other. The vertical peace between us and God means horizontal peace, us with each other. And then he says in verse 15, and be thankful. Easy to miss that little bit at the end of verse 15, isn't it? And be thankful. But Paul prayed that the Colossians would be thankful back in Colossians chapter 1, and now he calls on the Colossians to be thankful. What undercuts the arrogance and self-centeredness that produces so much anger, rage, malice and slander? Thankfulness. And what is the cure for the complaining and grumpiness that sours Christian relationships and Christian communities? Thankfulness. Thank you, God, that every good gift comes from you. Thank you, God, that you've given me what I don't deserve. They're great prayers, aren't they, to pray 
expressing our thankfulness and overcoming evil. In many ways, the goal and essence of Christian faith is thankfulness. And on days when it feels like there's not much to be thankful to God for, we can keep turning our eyes back to Jesus, turning our eyes back to the Gospel, turning our eyes back to Easter and seeing all that God has done for us in Christ and be thankful. In fact, our hearts should sing and our voices ring with thankfulness. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 16, let the Word of Christ, that means the Gospel, dwell richly, or dwell among you richly. How? Well, verse 16, as you teach and admonish, that means challenge, one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. When you sing, who are you talking to? I know you're going to say God. That's actually not quite what it says, is it? Each other. With our mouths, we do it out loud. We remind each other of great gospel truths of what God has done for us in Jesus through words. See, otherwise we could actually just stand and sing quietly in our hearts. New song begins, you stand there, Love this song. <laughs> really enjoy it. Ah. But we sing out loud because that encourages one another and actually urges one another on to be thankful to God, to have gratitude in our hearts, because we actually sing to God in our hearts. Grateful for what He's done in Christ. Thankful. Thank you, God. That's what it says, isn't it? With gratitude in your hearts to God. Our hearts should be full of thankfulness and our minds should be good of should be so focused on Jesus that we speak and live for Jesus or as Paul puts it there in verse 17 whatever you do whether in word or deed do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks there it is again giving thanks to God the Father through him everything's to be done in Jesus name he's the focus of everything Everything is to be done with thankfulness to God, since God gives us everything. Paul mentions giving thanks again and again in this letter, because one of the keys to the Christian life is being thankful to God for what He's given us in Christ. And Paul says that whatever we do, we should have a Christ-centred approach that includes our relationships. And actually, there's more on that next week, uh, so stay, stay tuned. But you can see already, can't you, how a raised life transforms all our relationships. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you know what? In Christ we have been raised to a whole new life and we're called to live a whole new lifestyle with a different mind and different heart, with different words and different goals, with different styles of relationship. In fact, with a different lifestyle. We've been raised with Christ to live a new life. So let's live a new life. Let's live for Jesus now and until He returns in glory. Let's live for Jesus and let's ask for His help. Let's pray. Our dear Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for all you've given us in Christ. We thank you that our old life has died in Him. Thank you that you've raised us to a new life with Him. And so now please help us to live for Him. Help us to put to death, to put in the bin those evil behaviours, even the ones we enjoy and like. Please help us to take on these new behaviours, these new virtues that give you honour, that give you pleasure. Please help us to live for Jesus now and always, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand as we sing our final hymn, Before the Throne of God Above?
Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me My name is graven on his hands My name is written on his heart I know that while in hell he stands No tongue can bid me thence depart No tongue can bid me thence depart Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free God the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him dead, the risen Lamb My perfect, spotless righteousness The great unchanged my Savior and my God. Please be seated. Uh, thank you once again, everyone, for being part of today's service. It is our prayer that um, you have found meaning in, today, in, in the um, message that was preached today. And uh, it is our prayer, too, that you would lead um, the resurrection life and the transformed life in Jesus. Let us close in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the great reminder for us this morning through the book of Colossians chapter 3. The reminder to live that resurrection life, that indeed our identity is found in Christ. We died, and our life is now with Christ. So help us, Lord, to live the life that is holy and pleasing to you. New lives that reflect your holiness. And help us, Lord, to kill off and to put bin sins that continue to enslave us. Help us, Lord, to make that commitment today. And help us, Lord, to no longer entertain sins that continue to enslave us. Lord, we pray and ask for your wisdom to enable us to live the type of life that will bring honour and glory to you. And above all, help us to put on love. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, our service has now ended. It is um, 12.30 on the dot. Um, so for those of you who are here, don't be in a hurry to rush off. There will be church lunch later today. And when the door uh, opens, uh, please feel free to make your way to the back hall to uh, join us in the fellowship lunch. So thank you all once again for joining us. And for those of you who are tuning in online, we do hope to catch up with you in person um, back in church one day. Thank you once again.